Hello, Jeff. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. Uh, my name is, uh, is Jeff Brown. And uh, as Andre said, I'm one of the uh, co-founders of the GRAILS framework and am the GRAILS practice lead here at OCI, which uh, again, as Andre said, is the uh, uh, OCI are the, uh, the stewards of the GRAILS framework and have been for some time now. Um, I've uh, uh, been involved in the, the GRAILS project since uh, pretty much the very beginning, uh, have helped, uh, so uh, Graham Roche and I co-authored a couple of the definitive guide to GRAILS books. Um, you can see a Twitter handle there and an email address uh, so you know how to get uh, get a hold of me if you need anything. Uh, I am based uh, here in uh, St. Louis, Missouri in the United States, uh, where we of course have the uh, have the Gateway Arch. Uh, this, is, uh, this is not my family, it's, uh, it's just a picture of them. Uh, here in St. Louis, uh, we have, uh, one of the great things about St. Louis is uh, we've got the St. Louis Cardinals here, and uh, the Cardinals, as uh, most of you probably know, are one of the uh, most successful and beloved uh, professional baseball teams in history. Uh, so I encourage you, if you're coming to St. Louis, uh, uh, hit us up and uh, we can take you to a ball game, uh, have some dinner, drinks. Uh, there's a lot of great stuff to see in St. Louis, but reach out to us if you're going to be in the area and uh, we'd love to talk to you. Uh, here at OCI, uh, we are, we're, we're a distributed company, uh, distributed all over the world, but our headquarters is in St. Louis. Uh, we've been around since the mid-90s and have been an open source company the entire time. Uh, we've got uh, more than 140 engineers uh, on the team here. Many of them have advanced degrees in their fields, and uh, we cover a whole lot of ground. Uh, we have a software engineering practice, an industrial Internet of Things practice. We do a whole lot of work around open source, and training has, uh, has been a big part of OCI's business since uh, since the very beginning, and certainly we offer a lot of training around uh, uh, Groovy and Grails and Gradle and really all the technologies in the, in the whole Groovy ecosystem. So uh, uh, definitely reach out and let us know whatever it is we can do to help you out around any of that. Um, so specifically uh, related to Grails, so OCI has been the home to Grails since uh, 2015, and uh, we're having uh, great success with the technology. We're investing heavily and uh, uh, growing the team uh, to help accelerate uh, the development work. Uh, so in the first couple of years, and in the last couple of years, we've been releasing about 30 releases per year, which is great. Um, we've, only been, we've only been able to do that by uh, growing the team and, and investing, uh, as I said, in the technology. Uh, we're really broadening the technology's reach, and that comes in a number of forms. We're expanding GORM to talk to lots of different databases and introducing new profiles for interacting with uh, lots of other technologies like React and Angular. And uh, we're, but the bottom line there is that we're, we're investing heavily in the technology and moving it forward just as quickly as we can. And uh, the, the uh, practice is having uh, great success, and I expect nothing but uh, more of the same in the, uh, in the future. So as I said, reach out to us if there's anything at all that we can do to help you out, and uh, we would uh, we would love to talk to you. So I want to get right into the uh, the, the technical details um, or the heart of the presentation. This is uh, uh, as uh, as it says a high level agenda of what uh, what I, I want to cover. So uh, we've got the introductions out of the way, and um, so as I said, Grails is the is the home of OCI and has been for uh, for, for quite a while now, and, and we're having great success. Um, but what I want to talk about uh, today is I want to talk about the relationship between IntelliJ IDEA and, uh, and Grails 3. I'll discuss a little bit of the history about uh, how we got to uh, where we are today. And uh, really what I want to get into is some differences between uh, Grails 2 and Grails 3 specifically that relate to uh, productivity in the uh, in the IDE and what kinds of capabilities the IDE can provide and, and so there's some details about uh, some critical change or significant changes that we made from Grails 2 to Grails 3. There are some of those details that specifically relate to um, IDE functionality and there's some confusion around uh, a lot of that in the community and what I want to do is, uh, is press into some of the capabilities that IntelliJ has that specifically relates to building Grails 3 applications, demonstrate some of that and uh, and clarify some uh, uh, some misconceptions around uh, the relationship between the two. Uh, part of that has to do with the uh, community edition of IntelliJ versus the ultimate edition. So I want to talk a little bit about that. That's uh, that's a, a particular area where there's some confusion in the community about uh, uh, how those two relate to doing Grails 3 development. 
So I'll do some demos and, and uh, I'll demonstrate some tips and tricks and things that I use uh, every day when I'm doing development in the IDE. Um, and, uh, and, and I think you'll find that uh, interesting and helpful. And then uh, at the end of the line, we'll, uh, we'll have time for Q&A and I'll address just uh, as, as much as I can around, uh, around any of that. So Grills 3 has been, uh, has been around for uh, more than uh, two years. So we're coming up on about two and a half years now since uh, Grails 3 was released. And Grails 3 was a, a major uh, iteration, a major step forward for the framework. There, there were significant changes in the framework. And uh, one of them has to do with the build system. And that's, this specifically relates to capabilities in the IDE. And I'm gonna demonstrate some of this. But in Grails 2, we had, in Grails 1 and Grails 2, we had our own build system. And it was built on top of a technology called Gantt, which is a, a really interesting Groovy library, which makes it easy to interact with uh, the Ant build tool and some of its supporting, uh, supporting uh, libraries and APIs. So Gantt uh, was a technology that we built a build system on top of for Grails 1 and 2. And uh, the build system, uh, was uh, was was flexible. We provided extension points so plugins could participate in the build system. Applications could contribute things to the build process. Um, so we had a, a, a somewhat featureful, flexible, extensible build system for Grails one and two. But what we did not have was a fully robust, uh, really complete, um, flexible build system. Uh, we didn't set out to, to solve that problem. We're, we're focused on building the web framework, and we built enough of a, a build tool to support that. The Grado guys uh, have done just a super fantastic job of building this really, really robust, extensible, full-featured build system that's much more capable than the build system that we had built for Grails 1 and 2. So one of the changes that we made in Grails 3 is uh, we removed... Uh, the, the whole build system from, from Grails 2 and replaced it with Gradle integration. And that offers a whole bunch of benefits. Um, one, we have this, this really robust and extensible build system now that has a much more capability than our lightweight build system had. Um, another is that uh, the fact that every Grails 3 application is built with Gradle allows us to eliminate a whole bunch of stuff that relates to uh, a build time plugins. So for example, in Grails 2, there are plugins for technologies like Covertura and CodeNark. And th these are both uh, build time technologies. So CodeNark is a tool that will do a static analysis of your source code and report uh, uh, suspicious things or things that uh, you might consider violations of, of how you want your code put together. But it's doing all that at build time. And Covertura is a technology for, um, for tracking code coverage. So you can run your, your tests and then the Covertura reports will tell you which parts of your system were covered by tests and which work. So we had plugins for those things in Grails 2, uh, Grails plugins for those things. And we do not have Grails 3 plugins for those technologies because we don't need them. Uh, because we replaced our build system with Gradle, uh, instead of needing a custom Grails plugin for those build time technologies, uh, you can use Gradle's plugin for those things, um, which just broadens the, the uh, kind of landscape of the possibilities. All, all the plugins that exist out there for Gradle, you can use those in Grails 3 now. So that, that's just one of the, the list of benefits that we get from moving to Gradle. Another has to do with IDE integration. And I'm going to demonstrate some of this in, in just a few minutes. So I'm going to jump into an IDE and, and uh, demonstrate some things that, that might not be obvious. Um, but in order for an IDE to be able to uh, work uh, effectively with a Grails 3 project, the IDE does not necessarily need to have explicit Grails 3 support. If the IDE has uh, really great Gradle support, which IntelliJ IDEA does, that, uh, that covers a whole lot of ground and gets you to a point where you can be productive building and developing and debugging and so forth, Grails 3 applications in the IDE. Um, so one of the big differences between, or one of the differences between IntelliJ's Community Edition and the Ultimate Edition is the Grails 3 support. And the Grails 3 support only exists in the uh, Ultimate Edition. Specifically, it's not in the community edition, and that's created some confusion. Uh, people uh, routinely will report you cannot do Grails 3 development in IntelliJ IDEA community edition, and that's just, that's not the case. You can, in fact, and, and I'll demonstrate some of that. And Gradle is a big part of that. So I'll come back to that momentarily when we get into the IDE, but uh, uh, that turns out to be a, a 
a really big deal for, for our users. Another thing that changed significantly uh, between uh, Grails 2 and Grails 3 is we've in Grails 3, we've, we've embraced a trait-based solution for a lot of things that used to be done at, uh, at runtime. And I'll go into that just a little bit, and then we'll, again, we'll see some of this manifest in the IDE in just a little bit. Um, so yeah, Grails developers are familiar with the fact that um, the framework adds a whole bunch of capability to classes that you write. So for example, in a Grails application, when you author a domain class, so a domain class is a, a class that represents something you're gonna persist to the database. Um, so in a Grails application, when you author a domain class, um, there's typically what you would do is you would write the class and declare the persistent properties in the class. So if you're writing the person class, the person might have a first name and a last name and an age or whatever it is that describes a person. And that might be all the code that you see in the source code for the person class. But then at compile time or at, at, at runtime, a bunch of capability has been added to that class. So for example, there's a method called save and you can create an instance of your domain class and invoke the save method and that will persist the object to the database. So you didn't have to write the save method. That save method is added to your domain class by the framework. And the save method is just one of many, many, there's lots and lots of, of methods that we add to domain classes and all of your other Grails artifacts like controllers and tag lists and services. Save is just one example. In early versions of Grails, uh, so say in Grails 1, all of those kinds of things were rigged up at runtime using expando meta class meta programming. So Groovy has capabilities that make it very easy to add behavior to classes at runtime. While the program is running, you can add methods to classes. And Grails did a lot of that in Grails 1. As the application was starting up, we would iterate over all of your domain classes and dynamically add the save method to them and all the other methods that need to be added to domain classes. So that's uh, that's a, a great set of capabilities, and it's, it's uh, the fact that Groovy supports that enables uh, Grails wouldn't even have been possible, uh, or wouldn't even have made sense if we didn't have those kinds of capabilities. But that flexibility is also somewhat expensive. Um, using runtime metaprogramming like that is expensive in terms of performance, and it's also expensive in terms of uh, memory consumption. All these meta methods uh, take up uh, space on the heap, and so there are costs associated with that. In Grails 2, we started moving away from that runtime metaprogramming and transitioning to compile time metaprogramming, where we're able to add these things to your classes at compile time. And in order to do that, the framework had to build its own uh, uh, internal contraption that as an application developer, you never had to interact with, but it was part of the core of the framework. And it was kind of our own uh, handmade trait-like system where we could add behavior to classes at compile time. In Grails 3, what we've done is eliminated almost all of that and moved to a trait-based solution. So Groovy, uh, recent versions of Groovy have support for traits and a trait is like a class, but um, unlike classes, uh, so Groovy and Java are both single inheritance languages, right? So when you author a class in Groovy, you, you have exactly one parent class. You cannot, there's no such thing as multiple inheritance. So you cannot extend from multiple classes, but you can implement multiple traits. And a trait is a lot like a class. You author a trait and it has methods and fields and properties. And then that trait, uh, a class can implement that trait and all that behavior becomes part of that class. And in addition to that, the class can implement any number of traits. So it's kind of like multiple inheritance where you can get behavior from a lot of different traits added to your class. The way that Grails 3 embraces that is uh, at, when you author a domain class, again, as an example, um, you don't have to express that that domain class implements any trait. The framework does that for you. How that relates to the IDE is because all of that behavior is being added to your classes at compile time in the form of traits, you get really great support from the IDE for things like auto-completion and step debugging. You can step right into methods that aren't even in your source code. Um, so for example, in a controller, when you invoke the respond method, if you're in debug mode, you can step into the respond method and then and what you'll be stepping into is the trait and you can debug what's going on. And that's all just so much easier to deal with than trying to debug and uh, understand what all is going on at runtime when runtime metaprogramming is going on as opposed to compile time metaprogramming. So again, that relates to the support that uh, the IDE can offer um, for doing Grails 3 development that is a significant improvement over what we were able to do with, uh, with Grails, Grails 1 and 2. 
So that's all just sort of some ideas at a somewhat high level. And what I want to do is jump into the IDE and demonstrate, uh, demonstrate a couple of things. What I'm going to do is I'm going to start with the community edition of IntelliJ here. So we're working with an edition of IntelliJ that does not have uh, Grails 3 support in it. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to open a project, a, a Grails 3 project. And uh, so, by the way, the, the process that I did there is uh, might be different than what Grails 1 and 2 developers are used to doing. So I don't want to create a new project from existing sources, and I don't want to import a project. What I want to do is open the project and uh, select the directory that is the parent directory, the top level directory of your Grails 3 project. And you should see a dialogue like this. And this is the IDE recognizing that this is a Gradle project. And that's going to enable a whole bunch of capabilities that, uh, that we'll be able to take advantage of. Um, so an important part of this dialogue right here is, is the radio button that says, use the default Gradle wrapper. Uh, you want to make sure that that is, that is configured. And if you do that, you don't have to configure a Gradle home. There's a place down here where you could configure a Gradle home. I advocate that you don't do that. Uh, a better idea is for you to use the Gradle wrapper that's in the project. That Gradle wrapper, since it's part of the project, is using a version of Gradle that is known to work with that version of, of Grails and that version of this application. And as you're switching back and forth between Grails projects, you don't want to have to switch to different versions of Gradle. If you're using the wrapper that's part of the Grails project, then whatever project you're working on, you'll be using its wrapper and that will have the version that's appropriate for that project. So um, having this radio button selected that says use default Gradle wrapper is an important step and uh, the IntelliJ guys default that to on just because that, that makes sense as a reasonable default. Uh, so the IDE um, uh, has opened the Grails project and remember we're in the community edition of IntelliJ here. Uh, the community edition does not have Grails 3 support, uh, but we're going to be able to do uh, um, a considerable amount of, uh, of development work with the community edition, even without Grails 3 support. So this directory structure here should look familiar to, uh, to Grails developers. You've got Grails-app, and below that, you've got directories like controllers and init. And uh, if we had services, you'd see a services directory. If we had domain classes, you'd have a domain directory. But notice that those directories don't exist here. And that, that relates to something that I want to point out that's uh, sometimes a, a point of confusion for folks. Um, so the project that I just opened is in Git. Uh, it's a Git repository. And uh, one, of the, one of the things about Git is uh, Git does not support storing empty directories. So when you create a brand new Grails application, typically the domain directory will be there below Grails app, as will the services directory and the taglib directory. All those directories will be there. So if you open the project in the IDE, the IDE uh, conspires with Gradle to figure out what your source directories are. And the domain and services folders would be configured as source directories, just like the controllers folder uh, if you can, I don't know if you can tell in the display or not, but the, the uh, folder right there is blue as opposed to some of the others that are gray. And the fact that that's blue indicates that that's a source directory. And the IDE was able to figure out that this is a source directory because it reached out to Gradle to say, to ask it, hey, where's all the sources for this project? And we've got integration built into, the, the, so Grails and Gradle are conspiring to, uh, so when you ask Gradle, what are the source directories, Gradle knows that this controllers folder is a source directory. Um, if I were to, so, so I'm going to start up the, uh, the Grails console here. So I'm going to open up the, uh, a, a terminal and I've just typed Grails W which is the, the Grails wrapper, not the Gradle wrapper, but the, the Grails wrapper. And what that's going to do is start up an interactive prompt here where I can type, uh, so if I type create-dom and I press tab, we'll get auto completion here for create domain class. And then I can specify the name of the domain class that I want to create. And that domain class was just created. Um, so notice that the domain folder here was just created and it's gray. It's, it's not a source folder. So if I started editing the files in that directory, I'm going to have some problems. If I do the uh, uh, try to navigate to a class uh, from the IDE, the IDE is not going to know that the source file or that the files in that directory represent classes. Um, so, so bottom line is I need to get this domain folder configured as a source folder. And one way to do that 
is if I right click on the folder and select mark directory as sources root, that, that would do it. That, that's one way to tell the IDE that that folder is a source folder. And you have to do that in order to, for the IDE to, to be able to, to be compiling classes that are in that folder. Uh, but another way to go about that is notice that this pop-up came up down here that says the Gradle uh, project needs to be imported. If I click import changes, what will happen is the IDE is going to kind of reevaluate the environment. It's going to go back to Gradle and say, hey, what are the current source directories? And at that point, since this domain folder exists, it will be configured as a source folder. Um, uh, earlier, just to clarify, when I mentioned that Git doesn't support tracking empty folders, I mentioned that because th this scenario that I'm stepping through right now comes up a lot with Rails apps, where someone will create the project, immediately put it in Git, and then someone else checks it out, um, and there's no domain folder, no services folder. And the first time you create a domain class or a service or a tag lib, you have to deal with this issue. So I can click import changes and uh, that will cause the IDE to reevaluate the environment. And uh, one of the effects of that will be the domain folder will be configured as a source folder. Um, in uh, Typically I have auto import enabled. So if you click that uh, enable auto import, what will happen is anytime the, the Gradle build changes, the IDE will recognize that and will automatically re-import things for you. Um, so you, you may or may not want that turned on. And uh, yet one more way, a third way to get this folder configured as a source folder is if you open the Gradle's tools view and select your top level project there and click the, uh, the little uh, circle refresh thing, the same thing will happen. So I, I just now click that and the IDE is now reaching out to Gradle to say, hey, what's, what's the current state of things? What needs to be configured as a source folder? And I expect a bunch of stuff is happening. Other stuff is happening as well. And once uh, once this rebuild down here completes, uh, this there we go. The domain folder just now turned blue, and we're in business. So um, be be aware of that. That uh, these artifact folders like domain and services, the ones that might not exist when the project is initially imported in the IDE, have to be configured as source folders. And it's a super simple thing to do. In fact, I practically never even have to think about it because I have, uh, in my uh, real development environment, I have that auto import enabled and it all just happens. Another place where that same thing, same kind of thing comes up is, um, uh, so, so since we're using Gradle as our build tool in Grails 3, uh, the way you express dependencies in a Grails 3 project is the same way you would express dependencies in any Gradle project. And that is in build.gradle, there is this dependencies block, and this is standard Gradle and Maven kind of syntax for expressing dependencies. If you were to add a dependency here or, or change a dependency, the IDE doesn't know about that uh, yet. So if you add a dependency on a library and then go start editing source code and try to use classes in that library, the build will succeed if you're building from Gradle, but the IDE will be confused and won't know about those the new library um, unless you've enabled auto import or after you add a dependency to this build.gradle file, come out here and do the same thing that uh, I mentioned before, and that is tell, uh, uh, tell the IDE to refresh, uh, refresh itself um, using, uh, by clicking this top level project and clicking refresh. And that tells the IDE to go reevaluate things. So now the uh, new dependencies that you've added here will be added to the project's class path from the IDE's perspective, and then you can start to reference classes that are in whatever library you've expressed the dependency on here. So be aware of that when you're doing Rails 3 development in, uh, in the IDE, anytime you change dependencies um, or introduce new source folders, uh, like the domain folder, uh, you, the IDE needs to kind of make another run at, at setting up the class path and the source paths, and the, all the different uh, techniques I just described are, are ways you can and go about doing that. All right. Now what I want to do is, uh, let's see, I want to start that console back up. I shouldn't have stopped that. What I want to do is uh, generate scaffolding for this person class that I just created. So let's say that a person has a, uh, has a first name and a last name, just like that. And uh, I want to generate uh, some scaffolding for that. Uh, so in the Grails console down here, if I type uh, generate, and again, I get uh, tab completion here. Um, so I can tab complete the generate all. And then if I start typing the name of a domain class and press tab, you also get auto, uh, auto completion there. So the, the console there knows about 
all of my domain classes and knows what's a reasonable thing to pass as a parameter to generate all. So I press that and now the default scaffolding has been generated for that, uh, uh, for the Persian class. So if we go look at our Persian controller and, and uh, notice that we didn't have to do anything special with the controllers folder to set it up as a, a source path because the controllers folder was populated um, when the project was initially imported because that's where we happened to put the URL mappings file. So the domain folder did not exist when we initially imported the project. So we had to deal with it as a source folder. The controllers folder did exist when we imported the project. So we didn't have to do anything special. Um, so in the IDE, I, I can I can add breakpoints, um, and uh, for the most part, the debugger is going to work here uh, just like it. Uh, Java developers are, are are used to it working. Um, one uh, uh, significant thing that changed in Grails three that that's related to debugging and just running the application in the IDE in general. A significant thing that changed is. Uh, remember that in Grails 1 and 2, we had our own build system. So in order to build the system or run uh, run the app or debug the app or really do anything at all with the application, the IDE had to do one of two things. It either had to shell out a process and effectively type Grails space and then some command on the command line, right? The IDE could just shell out a process like that. Or the IDE could make calls into our build system through, uh, through an API. Um, but the IDE had to had to specifically know about Grails in order to do either of those things, um, and that's not the case with uh, with Grails three. Again, remember we're in the ultimate edition of IntelliJ. I'm sorry, we're in the community edition of IntelliJ that does not have Grails three support. In Grails three, we've added the ability to run uh, the Grails application via a standard uh, public static void main method. So the, every Java IDE knows how to run a class that has a main method in it. So if I, I just right clicked in this uh, editor and I'm going to run the application and the, as far as the IDE is concerned, all that's happening is it's just invoking this main method. It's not starting up Tomcat or doing anything Grailsy, right? All it's doing is executing this main method, just like any other standard, standard main method in a Java program. And the effects of doing that is right now Tomcat is being started up. Uh, the application is being built and deployed to that Tomcat. Um, all of that happens uh, just by running the main method in this class, which makes it much, much easier for, uh, for the application to be run from, uh, from the IDE. Um, so uh, again, we can get the application running without any support from the IDE at all, or at least any Grail specific support. So I, I've stopped the app there. Um, so when I, when I ran the application, this application run configuration was created. Right, and, uh, IntelliJ developers will be, or users will be uh, familiar with this. This is kind of just standard stuff. There's nothing Grailsy about this. This is a, you specify the class that has the main method in it, and the IDE knows what to do with that. So once that run configuration is created, uh, one way to run the app from this point is I can click the green arrow to run the application, or I can click the, the green bug uh, to run the application in debug mode. And that's what I've just done. And we've got a, uh, a breakpoint in this uh, person controller. So uh, the debugging agent has started. You see that uh, represented in the console there. As soon as Tomcat's up and running, I can send a request to the application and we'll be able to uh, uh, hit this breakpoint and debug the application largely like you could any JVM app in, the, in IntelliJ. So there we go. We're interacting with the default scaffolding. I just hit this breakpoint. And I uh, can do most of the same stuff that you would expect to be able to do in a, a step debugger here. So I can interrogate this controller and see all the properties that are in the controller. And even though none of these properties uh, have corresponding source code entries, this is all stuff that's been added to your controller by the framework. Even though the, uh, the IDE doesn't know anything at all about Grails here, it's able to inspect and discover all of these properties that are in this class. Um, because all of those properties have been added to the bytecode at compile time by, uh, by Grails. This is very different than what you would see, say, in, uh, in Grails 1, where everything was being added dynamically at runtime. Uh, you wouldn't be able to inspect uh, these, these properties because the IDE wouldn't know how to even discover that, that they existed. 
Um, so you get uh, a really, really great support for running the application, debugging the application, you can run unit tests, you can do most of what you can, you can, you can cover a whole lot of ground in, in the community edition of, an, of IntelliJ without any Grail specific tooling. There's some things you're not going to get. So you're not going to get uh, like a, a GSP editor with uh, auto completion. You're not going to get anything Grail specific. Um, but the application absolutely can be built, run, debugged, uh, you can run your tests. Um, so there was, a, there was a period of several months after we released Grails 3, before the first version of IntelliJ was released that included Grails 3 support. And during those months, I used the community edition of IntelliJ every single day and uh, was completely productive. And, and uh, it was, it, it's just a, a fine environment for doing Grails 3 development, even without the Grails 3 support. The Grails 3 support in the Ultimate Edition is even better. You get a bunch of, of Grails specific support. You get uh, uh, like a GSP editor, you get uh, wizards for creating artifacts. So well, you can right click and say, create a new controller, create a new domain class, that sort of thing. Uh, you get a visual representation of the relationship between your domain classes. You, you get Grails specific stuff out of the Ultimate Edition that you don't get from the Community Edition. You also get things like, I can't, um, so, so notice that this word respond it's easier to see maybe on line 17. Um, the word respond is underlined and that's the IDE telling you, hey, I'm not sure if this is a valid method call or not, right? Groovy allows, uh, supports dynamic dispatch. You can call methods that don't exist. Um, so the fact that the IDE doesn't know that that's a valid method call doesn't make it invalid code. The code still compiles and works as it should, but the IDE is, is suggesting, hey, I don't know if that's a valid method call or not. It is, but the IDE can't verify that. The same with this call to person.counts and this reference to params. So those black underlined um, items there are things that the IDE can't, that doesn't know about. Um, so that, that's why they're underlined uh, as black there. But what I wanna do now is I wanna get out of uh, the community edition and we're gonna jump into the ultimate edition and demonstrate a couple of things. But one of the things I wanted to be clear about is, is that you absolutely you can do Grails 3 development in the community edition of IntelliJ and be very, very productive. Uh, there are things that are missing, um, all the Grails specific stuff and, and the other, other items that I just now mentioned, um, but absolutely can be, can be made to work. So what I wanna do right now is I'm gonna check a Grails 3 project uh, out from our uh, GitHub repository. And we're gonna do that. Uh, so I wanna import um, this, uh, this, I'm gonna clone a remote Git repository is what I'm doing here. Again, we're not taking advantage of any Grail specific capability here. This is capabilities that the, um, that the IDE has. So the IDE knows how to clone a project from, uh, uh, from a Git repository, knows how to deal uh, with, uh, with Gradle. The IDE just recognized that this project is in fact a Gradle project, so I can open it. Uh, and all the stuff that we just saw in the community edition will also happen here in the ultimate edition. Um, and I'm gonna demonstrate some uh, additional capabilities that the IDE has to offer. All right, so the IDE is uh, um, uh, uh, dealing with Gradle right now to figure out what kind of project this is, what, um, what are the source directories, uh, what dependencies does this project have? Uh, the dependencies are important, of course, to be added to the, the IDE's class path. And once the, uh, the import's complete, uh, so now we're in a very similar state to, that we were in the community edition. So again, notice there's no domain folder. This project doesn't happen to have any domain classes or tag libs. Um, so if we create domain classes or tag libs, we'd have the, the same issues here that we have uh, in the community edition. And that is what we'd have to tell the IDE that those uh, folders are uh, our source folders. Uh, this particular project has uh, has a, a simple unit test in it that's going to allow me to that I'm going to use to point out a couple of things that uh, uh, that are simple but are important to know if you're doing Rails development in uh, in the IDE. So just like you can run the application or debug the application without um, any Grail specific interactions from the IDE, um, the, the same is true with with unit tests. So if I right click in this unit test and select run, the unit test will run. And the first time you run the first test in the projects and building has to happen. Um, so th this, this first test run will take longer than any, any subsequent test run. But once everything is built, um, then we'll be able to rerun the test more quickly. 
And by the way, so, so I'm, I'm tr trying to not use keyboard shortcuts here so you can see what I'm doing by right clicking and clicking menus. Uh, my own preference is uh, I'm more productive using uh, keyboard shortcuts for all this kind of stuff. So you can see there in the, in the menu that the keyboard shortcut to run a test is uh, control shift R. And that's how I would typically run uh, uh, run a unit test. I'm, I'm using the menu so you can see what's going on. But one of the great things about IntelliJ is as uh, uh, a lot of folks are like me and that is uh, they prefer to do uh, everything that they can with a keyboard as opposed to, to using a mouse. Uh, for me personally, I'm more productive using the keyboard and everything that I want to do in the IDE, I can do with keyboard shortcuts. Most of the things have keyboard shortcuts already mapped to them. You can, you can see the keyboard shortcuts next to lots of these menus. And there's a, a system in the preferences where you can, can you can map your own arbitrary keyboard shortcuts to almost any capability that the IDE provides. Um, so that, that's one part. It's only one on a long list, but it's one piece of uh, why I really love IntelliJ and why I'm so productive in IntelliJ is I can configure it to do the things that I want to do. And since I'm a keyboard user, I can map keyboard shortcuts to everything that, uh, uh, that I do uh, routinely. And that just makes me more productive. All right, so this test just ran and the test passed, um, but the test is actually running in a, in a state that we don't want it to run in right now. And I'll clarify what I mean by that. So I'm gonna add a test here that has an expectation that the current environment is test. Right, so Grails has the notion of uh, environments that your application can be, uh, can be running in. Uh, so, for example, typically when you type Grails space run app, um, the application runs in development mode. When you run your tests, the application is supposed to run in test mode. And when you build a WAR file or an executable jar file, the application is supposed to run in production mode. And then you can have different data sources configured for those uh, different environments. You can have blocks of code that uh, behave different. You can have different spring beans for different environments. Uh, lots of things in your application might be different based on which environment you're running in. So when your tests are run, um, the current environment should be test. Um, and I'll press the keyboard shortcut here to rerun this test. And uh, what we'll see is that test is gonna fail because the test is actually not running in the test environment. We'll see that it's, it's actually running in the development environment, which is, uh, uh, depending on what your application is doing, might be problematic. So once that test runs, the second two tests should still pass, but the assertion on line 12 uh, is what I expect to fail. And it did fail, right? So we expected environment.current to be equal to test, but instead it was development. So one of the nice things about uh, the changes, uh, one, one of the nice things about the way the way Grails 3 is put together is the IDE can run the tests without having to interact with any Grails environment stuff. Um, and that, that's what we're doing. But one small cost of that is when the IDE runs the test, the environment is not set up um, such that the test will run in the test environment. They're gonna run in the development environment. And there's a simple way to fix that. And that is in the run configuration for the test, if you set uh, the grails.env system property to test, that will cause the test to run in the test environment. So if I rerun this test, the test should pass now. But a problem with the approach that I just now took is that uh, you might have lots and lots of tests in your project. You should have lots and lots of tests in your project. You might have hundreds or thousands of tests and you don't wanna have to go uh, do that minus D grails.env thing in every single one of your uh, run configurations for your tests. So notice that the test did just pass. Um, so there's a better way to fix this problem. Um, so what I did was I added uh, the highlighted text there, minus D grails.env equals test. I added that to the VM options for this particular run configuration for that spec. And then if I went and ran another spec, I'd have to do the same thing. Uh, that's not great. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna delete that run configuration. So it's gone now. And um, in, in the IDE, there is this uh, list of uh, uh, sort of templates for creating run configurations. And really the best way to explain this is just to jump into it. So there's a JUnit run configuration template here. And however this thing is configured, 
from that point forward, every J unit run configuration that's created will be configured um, per what's defined here. So for example, if I say grails minus env equals test, and I'll set another one here, favorite framework equals grails, um, that won't actually be used for anything, but I'm putting it there so we'll, we'll see it uh, show up someplace else in a moment. So what I've done is I've edited the default template for um, uh, JUnit run configuration. And be aware that this does not change any of your existing configurations, which is why I deleted the, the spec configuration a moment ago. I wanted to get rid of that one, then edit this template. And now from this point forward, all of the run configurations, the JUnit run configurations that are created will be created with that template. So if we go look at this that was just created, see these things are both there now. So from this point forward, every time I run a unit test, it'll be configured with those system properties, which is, which is what I want. So that's a one-time uh, small configuration thing I have to do upfront when, uh, uh, when I first uh, set up the project. And then from that point forward, it's, it's in place and I, I don't have to think about that anymore. So be aware that when you're running your tests from the IDE, they will run in the development environment unless you say otherwise. The way to say otherwise is to set the grails.env system property and assign it a value of test. And a simple way to impose that is to edit the JUnit uh, run configuration thing that, uh, that I just demonstrated. All right, so we could run this application uh, any of a number of ways. We could right click here and run it just like I did in the community edition, uh, run the main method. Another thing I could do is uh, I could run it from the command line by typing grails space run app. I can run it uh, from Gradle using um, uh, the boot run task. So there are several ways that I can run the project. So I've just run it using Gradle W boot run. Uh, if, uh, if you prefer to uh, click on stuff uh, rather than typing things, you can come out here to the, uh, the Gradle tool window and uh, someplace around here is uh, right there is boot run. So I could double click on that. And that's effectively the same thing as having typed boot run on the command line. So there, there are a number of ways that, that the application can, can be run. Uh, so use uh, whichever is, uh, uh, suits your development mode and, and whatsoever, whatever's most productive for you. Uh, remember that uh, a way that I could debug this project is uh, just like we saw in the community edition. I can uh, debug the application right here. Uh, once the run configuration is created up here, I can click the green bug to run the thing in debug mode. Um, and, and those are uh, both of those are, are, are somewhat obvious to, to folks who are familiar with uh, working in the IDE. But another technique, one, one that I use frequently that is not as obvious is when you run the application from Gradle using the boot run task, one of the things you can do is specify minus minus debug minus JVM. So that's dash dash debug dash JVM. And what that is gonna do is that's gonna tell Gradle to start up the debugging agent when the application starts up. And that's what, what just now has happened is the debugging agent has been, uh, has been started up and it's configured to suspend, which means uh, right now the process is, is blocked and waiting for a remote debugger to connect to the process. And it'll wait, uh, I think forever. I don't know if there's a timeout, but it'll wait for a very long time. So it's, it's just paused right now. The application's never gonna start up until we connect a remote debugger. And this is another thing that a lot of folks uh, don't know how to do, but uh, IntelliJ has great support for um, uh, creating a remote debugging session. Uh, so what I want to do is I want to create a new run configuration in the IDE here, and the type is called remote. And uh, I think that might be easier for folks to kind of discover that that's there if it was labeled remote debug. I think some folks don't uh, aren't, aren't sure what what that's about. But um, so I want to create a new remote configuration, and I typically call mine RDB just for remote debug, um, just a short name. Uh, but you can call the thing anything you like. And almost always, these defaults are going to be what you want. So I'll click OK there. And all that's happened so far is we've created a run configuration called RDB. Uh, we haven't started it. We've just created it. The process is still down here waiting for us to connect uh, a remote debugger. So if I, if I select the RDB run configuration and click the bug, that just now started up the uh, remote debugger in the IDE. 
and that remote debugger has connected to the debugging agent that has been activated in our, our program, and now our program is, is up and running. I go out here to localhost colon 8080, and uh, get out here, we can search for one of my favorite prog rock bands, King Crimson, and uh, click search iTunes. And a request just now was sent out to the iTunes Apple Store, and these are all the search results that, uh, that came out of that. I can click on uh, one of those links, and now I'm off into the Apple Store doing whatever the Apple Store allows me to do there. Um, but my application's up and running, and it's running in debug mode because I started it with minus minus debug minus JVM, and I connected a remote debugger. So now if I were to come out here and put a, put a breakpoint uh, in my controller, come back to the app and search for initiate another search. We just hit this breakpoint. I can see the search term. I can interrogate the whole uh, state of the world uh, around me at this point in the program. Um, so it's, uh, it's super easy to uh, connect a remote debugger to your Grails application uh, from the ID. So again, I'm gonna stop the app. But the steps that I use there is when I ran the application from Gradle, I included the minus minus debug minus JVM, and then I had to connect the remote debugger from the IDE, which is super simple to do. Um, but you only have to do that. You only need the remote debugger stuff if you're using this approach, the minus debug JVM business. If you were debugging the application by uh, uh, using the uh, uh, IDE's built-in debug support, you wouldn't have to monkey with any of that. It just turns out that uh, as I'm doing development, there, for various reasons, I might want to be starting the application from Gradle, and uh, I might also want to be debugging the application, so I, I get to do both of them. And uh, the IDE makes all of that uh, really, really, uh, really easy to do. So the IntelliJ really is a, a super productive environment uh, for me. I've been using IntelliJ for a very long time. I use it every day. Uh, the whole team, the whole Grails team here at OCI uses uh, IntelliJ uh, every day. And it's just by itself, kind of, it's all, it's all alone as the, the very best IDE for, uh, for doing uh, Rails 3 development. So I would really say the same thing for doing JVM development in general. But in particular, I spend all of my time doing Rails work and the thing just works awesome. Uh, so maybe some of the reasons that uh, you might choose, uh, put on the, the short list of, of reasons that I think IntelliJ really is the, the very best IDE for doing uh, Rails 3 development. One is uh, you've got licensing options, right? You can use the community edition, which is open source. It's free. Um, it's a great way to take the thing out for a spin and, and see if you like it. You can also use the ultimate edition uh, for free uh, for uh, 30 days, I believe. Uh, you can download the thing. It's fully operational. It's not restricted in any way other than uh, time limit. But uh, you've got options. You can use the free open source version of the IDE, or you can get um, uh, even more, more support from the, uh, from the ultimate edition. Uh, another reason that I, IntelliJ really is uh, the very best IDE for doing Grails 3 development is uh, the long history that we've uh, had together. Uh, the guys at uh, the folks at JetBrains built really, really great support for Grails from the very, very beginning. Uh, really, to be honest, I believe that they had really great support for Grails before uh, it might have even made sense to do that. I was really impressed and excited at how quickly uh, JetBrains uh, got on board and invested significantly in building really, really great Ruby support, really great uh, Grails support um, that they, they've just uh, kind of led the, led the way the, the entire time. So we've been at this for uh, almost or a little over 10 years now. Grails has existed. And for almost that entire time, IntelliJ IDEA has had really, really great Grails support. We've got really great Grails 1 support, great Grails 2 support, and even better Grails 3 support. Um, we've got really great collaboration between the teams. So uh, Daniil and, and the other folks there at JetBrains who build the, uh, the Groovy and the Grails support, anytime we, we've got an issue or questions or ideas for how to make things better, uh, we here at the, the Grails team will reach out to those guys. They're always super easy to work with, uh, really friendly, really smart, productive folks. Um, and uh, that's been an important part of, uh, I think it's been an important part of enabling the IDE to have such great support for uh, the framework over the years. 
and uh, the, the support kind of goes in both directions. Often uh, the folks at JetBrains will reach out to us with uh, something that's unclear uh, about uh, how, how Grails works internally or something that relates to support they're building in the IDE. Uh, Daniel or one of the other folks out there will reach, reach out to us and, and, uh, and we'll work with them because it's in our interest for them to have really great support as well. So the, the collaboration between the teams has always been really, really great. Um, I think we worked work together well, and uh, the end result is is what you see, and that is just really, really first-rate support for the Grails framework in the IDE. It really is the, the very best Grails 3 support. Um, I, I don't think there's, uh, there's any question about that. And really, all of this stuff really boils down to the most important part is, is productivity. And productivity has always been a guiding principle in the Grails framework. When we make design decisions for how things are going to work in the framework, productivity is always at the top of the list. How can we make things uh, uh, more productive for the developer? Developer productivity might be the, the single most important factor. It's certainly on the short list as when we implement new features and ideas and, and make decisions about how we want things to work in the framework. And you can tell just from a user's perspective that the folks at JetBrains take the exact same approach. It's uh, an idea is just a super productive environment. For me, I like to do everything with a keyboard. The IDE allows me to do that. It's really, really flexible. Folks who don't like to do that, you've, uh, you don't have to do that, right? There's not just one way to do things. The IDE prov provides options that uh, make uh, that will make the most sense for different options will make uh, more sense for different folks. But productivity is, is really, uh, key from both of our perspectives, from the Grails team's perspective and from JetBrains, and uh, I think uh, uh, we've uh, both both, uh, both teams have done a really really great job of uh, achieving those goals. Uh, I use, as I said before, I use IntelliJ IDEA every single day, and uh, I could not be happier with uh, the productivity, uh, specifically uh, for building uh, Grails applications. It just uh, it couldn't be better. So I've got nothing but nothing but great things to say about the IDEA. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Uh, Jeff, thank you for uh, taking your time and making this wonderful presentation. And thanks for all, to all attendees for, for actually uh, joining us. And again, uh, for questions, there's a Slack channel about, uh, for uh, Grails, and there's a dedicated channel around IntelliJ IDEA. So feel free to ask all the questions unanswered today there, and Daniel and Maybe I or maybe even Jeff will be happy to 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 answer and help you. Definitely. Fantastic. Awesome. Thanks everyone. Uh, stay tuned for more webinars and yeah, have a good day.